to adore Thee. May I still Thy goodness prove, while the hope of endless glory fills my heart with joy and love. Oh, to grace how great a debtor daily I am constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Never let me wander from thee. Never leave the God I love. Here's my heart. Oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Good morning. Hey, we are, woo, there we go. Now we're hot. Good morning. Hey, it's great to have you here this morning. We are so glad that uh, we have come together uh, to, to praise God, to lift up his name, to worship him. Today is also a special Sunday at Twickenham as we honor our seniors and wish them well. Uh, we'll have a big banquet for them tonight, but during service today, you'll notice uh, names by all the songs. Those are songs picked out by our seniors. Uh, one of our youth ministers, Caleb Gendron, will be doing our lesson this morning. Uh, other than me, your participants this morning will be our seniors uh, and their dads, and just uh, I know that it will be a special Sunday for them. Uh, but we're glad you're here. If you're a guest and visiting with us this morning, uh, there are cards on the back of the seat in front of you, uh, and this is for members also. If you would fill that out, and you can place those in the plate when they are passed a little bit later, just so we have a record of your attendance. There's a spot on those uh, where you can notify us of prayer request, uh, and we send those. Uh, our staff prays over them. Our elders pray over them. So if there's something that you need uh, specifically prayed for, uh, let us know, uh, because we want to, to be a part of that and to pray for that for you. I also wanted to mention that uh, for those that may be looking uh, for a church home, uh, we're looking for members and would love to have you join us on the journey that we're on. Uh, we have a new member lunch that's scheduled for June 24th, uh, and if you're interested in being a part of that or placing membership or have questions about Twickenham, uh, please let us know. Uh, stop me, see me, shoot me an email, steve at twickenham.org. We'd love to have you be a part of, of what we're doing here in the ministries and the work that's going on here. Uh, if you will stand, Cade is uh, leading our worship this morning. Appreciate him filling in with Lincoln out of town uh, as we continue our worship to God. Oh, Lord, our strength and song, highest praise to him belongs. Christ the Lord, our conquering King, your name we raise, your triumph sing. Praise the Lord, our mighty warrior. Praise the Lord, the glorious one. By his hand we stand in victory, and by his name we overcome. Though the storms of hell pursue, in darkest night we worship you. You divide the raging sea. From death to life, you safely lead. Praise the Lord, our mighty warrior. Praise the Lord, the glorious one. By his hand, we stand in victory. And by his name, we overcome all the saints. And angels bow, hosts of heaven are crying out, glory, glory to the King, you reign for all eternity, praise the Lord, our mighty warrior, praise the Lord, the glorious one, by his hand we stand in by his name we overcome the lord shall reign forever and ever the lord shall reign forever and ever the lord shall reign forever and ever the lord shall reign forever Forever and ever. Praise the Lord, our mighty warrior. Praise the Lord, the glorious one. 
and by his name we overcome. Praise the Lord, our mighty warrior. Praise the Lord, the glorious one. By his hand we stand in victory, and by his name we overcome. And by his name we overcome. What a beautiful name it is, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. Death could not hold you, the veil torn before you. You silence the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. You have no rival, you have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory, yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is, what a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is, nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Be seated, please. <clears throat> I will lift you up high, my God, the true King. I will bless your name forever and always. I will bless you every day. I will praise your name forever and always. The Lord is great and so worthy of praise. God's greatness cannot be grasped. One generation will praise your works to the next one, proclaiming your mighty acts. They will talk all about the glorious splendor of your majesty. I will contemplate your wondrous works. They will speak of the power of your awesome deeds. I will declare your great accomplishments. They will rave in celebration of your abundant goodness. They will shout joyfully about your righteousness. The Lord is merciful and compassionate, very patient and full of faithful love. The Lord is good to everyone and everything. God's compassion extends to all his handiwork. All that you have made gives thanks to you, Lord. All your faithful ones bless you. They speak of the glory of your kingdom. They talk all about your power to inform all human beings about God's power and the majestic glory of God's kingdom. Your kingdom is a kingship that lasts forever. Your rule endures for all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all that he says, faithful in all that he does. The Lord supports all who fall down, straightens up all who are bent low. All eyes look to you hoping, and you give them food right on time, opening your hand and satisfying the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways, faithful in all his deeds. The Lord is close to everyone who calls out to him, to all who call out to him sincerely. God shows favor to those who honor him, listening to their cries for help and saving them. The Lord protects all who love him, but he destroys every wicked person. My mouth will proclaim the Lord's praise, and every living thing will bless God's holy name forever and always. Take our offering at this time. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. 
that you would take my place. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. You lay down your life. That I would be set free. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is amazing grace. This is a failing love. This is a failing love. That you would take my place. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. You laid down your life. That I would be set free. And I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Let's stand for this song, please. There's a song that cannot be contained. There's a shout that breaks through every chain. God, we won't be silent. There's a faith that rises through the flames. There's a joy that chases the dark away. God, we won't be silent. And the greater the storm, the louder our song. We lift our voices, lift our voices. Make your praise so glorious, glorious. We lift our voices, lift our voices. Make your praise so glorious. There's a faith that rises through the flames. There's a joy that chases the dark away. God, we won't be silent. And the greater the storm, the louder our song. We lift our voices, lift our voices. Make your praise so glorious, glorious. We lift our voices, lift our voices, make your praise so glorious. We'll never stop singing, singing. 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 We lift our voices, lift our voices, make your praise so glorious, glorious. We lift our voices, lift our voices, make your praise so glorious. And the greater the storm, the louder our song. We'll never stop singing, singing. We'll never stop singing, singing. We'll never stop singing, singing. We'll never stop singing, singing, Lord. sing the song as we enter into our time of communion together. There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide. Where all the love I ever found Comes like a flood, comes flowing down. At the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in all of you, I'm in all of you. Where your love ran red and my sin washed white, I owe all to you, I owe all to you.
this morning as we come together to um, celebrate with this senior class, we also come together to celebrate in this communion to remember the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior. Um, as I was thinking about what I was going to say today, and um, the one thing that kept popping into my mind was on senior day, it's kind of a real emotional day for the parents especially, maybe not so much for the kids, but for the parents, it's for those of us that have been through it, it's, um, it can be really emotional. And, and in, in relating that to the communion and to um, Jesus' death on the cross, I, the thing that kept popping into my mind was um, the, the pain that the Father and the Son must have experienced as they were separated because of our sins on the cross. Um, it's this gift of salvation that brings us here today, that brings us around this table. And it's not something that we have um, earned. It's nothing that we can obtain through our works. It's something that was given. Ephesians 2.8 says, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Romans 11.6, And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. The gift of salvation is not something that we've earned. It's freely and fully given because of God's love for us. Let's bow. Father, we come before you now, and as we are about to take this bread, we, we remember the, the pain that you felt as you suffered for our sins. Father, we, um, we're so thankful for that sacrifice, so thankful for that gift. Um, nothing that we can earn, nothing that we can do to earn that gift, just something that you gave freely to us. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen.
praise and honor unto thee. See, the stone is rolled away. Behold the empty tomb. salvation when your love poured out over me now my soul cries out hallelujah praise and honor unto thee praise and honor unto Oftentimes, as teenagers, we try to do things our way. We ignore the advice and instructions of our parents. We don't accept what is given to us. In the same way, Christ's sacrifice and his communion is a gift we must choose to receive. Even an act of choosing to eat and drink the communion is an act of faith. We are accepting his promise and inviting him to live within us and change us. As we drink this cup, let it remind us of God's gift to us and acceptance of this gift. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord, Romans 6, 23. Would you bow with me? Dear Lord, we are so thankful for the sacrifice you made on the cross. As we take this cup, may we remember the blood you shed and the burden you carried. We pray that you will bring us each one of us, closer to you, and bring peace to our minds and hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. As the deer thirsts for the water, Lord, so my soul longs after you. My soul thirsts for the living God. Yes, my soul longs after you. And I pour out my soul deep within. Deep within me I pour out my soul. Draw me deeper, Lord, deeper, Lord, in you. Draw me deeper, Lord, deeper, Lord, in you. And I pour out my soul deep within Pour out my soul. 
everyone stand for this song, please. There's a stirring deep within me. Could it be my time has come? When I see my gracious Savior face to face when all is done, is that his voice I am hearing? Come away, my precious one. Is he calling me? Is he calling me? I will rise up, up rise up. time has come when I see my gracious Savior face to face when all is done is that his voice I am hearing come away my precious one is he calling me is he calling me I will rise Morning, Twickenham. Um, for this morning, I want you all to think of me as Jody Vickery, since I'll be preaching. I'm obviously the young, handsome version of Jody Vickery, but you can think of me all the same. I gotta say, I mean, that guy has the most zingers I've ever met in one person's life, so he's not here today. I had to get mine in there before he could get back at me, so. Um, that felt pretty good. Um, so I'm here today, actually, because uh, I'm one of the youth ministers here at Twickenham. My name's Caleb Gingerin, and as we already said, today is Senior Sunday. So today is the day we do it once a year, every year, as we should, to celebrate the seniors we have that are graduating with us today. Very special occasion. Um, for me personally, I've got two goals in this sermon. Uh, first is to bring us into a greater unity with one another as a whole church body. Typical sermon goal right there, but I had to say it. Uh, second goal is to help us all gain a little bit more, should I say, reminder of what it was like, maybe if we were in their shoes. The sermon might fit more towards you all. I'm going to be looking in your direction more often, but I hope we, I can remind us all of that sense of when perhaps we were at the moment of a life-changing event or when our future of tomorrow felt a little hazy or uncertain. Um, so for some of you today, that's not going to be too hard, because although you're not graduating high school or putting a, saying goodbye to the book section titled Childhood, you are experiencing some type of life change. Uh, for the, those of you, though, that seem to be experiencing systematic, simplified, no worries lifestyle, well, we take confession here, I'll be in the back, and uh, you can confess that little lie. We're, we're all experiencing some form of change. Um, whether it be the small or the big, there is some reality of that. Um, so, as a part of today's sermon, we're also going to be looking at the end of Joshua, chapter 24. 
We're looking at that because it kind of fits perfectly this day's um, format as well as what series we've been in. Uh, if you've been with us for the past number of weeks that the older Jordi um, has been preaching, uh, I'm curious, too, to see how well we paid attention. So let's see if you can finish my sentence. Jody has been preaching a sermon series called Joshua, Faith for Where We've... So now I know how Jody feels. <laughs> let's, let's try that again. So we're in, currently in the series Joshua, Faith for Where We've... Never been. never been. Faith where we have never been. Today we're looking at kind of a faith for where they've never been, but that's our sermon series, and it fits, it, Joshua 24 fits extremely well for today's format. So um, if, you're, if you want to follow along with me, bookmark that, because as anything in Scripture, we're going to start in Genesis, so turn with me to Genesis 12, because that's really where we're going to begin today. Faith for where we've never been, that's basically been the mantra for the Israelites since uh, their beginning. If you remember, it kind of begins with the man named Abraham, or Abram, as he was originally named. Um, a man who had originally followed the faith of his father, that was not our faith, until God, or Yahweh, as, as he's called, calls on a man named Abram and says, I want you to birth a nation. So travel with me a far distance so that you can begin this journey. God speaks to him then, and then the second time God ever speaks to Abram, as we get in Genesis, this is in Genesis 12, verses 6 and 7. So God has brought Abram to a distance. He calls on him, verse 6. It says, Abram traveled through the land as far as the great sea of Morah at Shechem. And at that time, the Canaanites were in the land, and the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. So I'm taking a little bit of an angle here and focusing in on the part that we don't normally focus in on is the location that Abram was at. It says, Abram went to the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. My favorite thing about Old Testament places is we don't really care a thing about any of them except for so much of the United States has been named after. There's probably some Shechem, Alabama. I just don't know where that is. Um, Anyways, I want you to focus in on that place. Second time God ever speaks to Abram is at Shechem, saying, to your offspring, I will give this land. It's kind of like, uh, for Abram, he was kind of in the wrong place at the wrong time. I don't know if you've ever used that phrase. Um, if I can confess myself for a second, perhaps I've used it most often, or at least what I think of is when I'm not ready to make the true confession of my parents as they're coming down on me saying, how could you have been at that place with those people, Caleb? Not, not recently. That was a little while ago for me now. And before my true confession, I'd say, like, Mom, Dad, you don't, you don't get it. I was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. That's all it was. Wrong place, wrong time. Although that's a really great cop-out phrase, um, I, I actually really love that phrase because I think it has... It really gets at such a very basic human experience. Isn't it true that you can be at the same place at the same time, and it can either be feeling the right place at the right time, the wrong place at the wrong time? It all has to do with something, timing, essence, I don't know, what have you. For example, you could feel as though it's not really the right place at the right time, whatever. You sit in a mundane brick building, maybe forced to every Sunday of your life up until you're about 18. It can be the feeling at times. It's just a go with the flow type of thing. That same exact building for some of you, like maybe we're talking about this one here, can be the place you get married. All of a sudden it becomes a much different place or the same place, just a different time. Or that same exact place at moments feeling mundane or go with the flow can be the spot you have some type of spiritual experience. What's the difference? You're sitting in the same seat, same place. Just something different of the timing. For a lot of our Lipscomb grads, um, I mean, I'm getting ahead of myself. For a lot of our graduates here today, Lipscomb University is another example where a lot of them spent their summers there at camp. It's where we go to Lipscomb University in Nashville, Tennessee 
for our summer camp. It's called Impact. So that's the time frame that you're having the time of your life. A lot of spiritual experiences, a lot of joys, a lot of highs. So if I take that personal on myself, Lipscomb is where I also went for a little while, but that was for my school. So the same exact location, classrooms, for me, aren't joyful and spiritually focused as much as my memories are anxiety and the next paper that's due, what have you. Same place, different time frame, if you see where I'm going at. Abram, you could say, was in the wrong place at the wrong time. In the sense that God promises to this, to this exact spot at Shechem, I will give you the land that you will be possessed. Yet Abram will never see it. If we know his story, Abram never gets to witness that in his lifetime. He just had to bank on the promise God gave him that someday this will be the right place at the right time. Many of us here in this building are not here for the very first time. Maybe you're visiting. There's a good chance you haven't. This is not your first time to visit. Um, a lot of us, though, have been here for a long time. I've met, I mean, myself, I'm, I'm here for the, about the first year. But I met a lot of people who have been here for, you guys have been here for a long time. <laughs> I didn't mean that. I didn't mean that as a jab. Um, <laughs> But, for example, you remember what this place looked like before the renovations. Some of you can remember the old wooden pews that felt so good to sit in. Some of you here with us even remember the very first Sunday worshipped in this exact same room. Crazy. Same place, just different time. And wasn't it true that on that day, for those of you who are here, there was this odd promise in the, in the air, this future that awaited something good would come. You couldn't quite put a language to it, but here we are today. Good things have happened. A lot of you seniors here today, and literally, maybe I'm speaking more to the parents. You remember, because you guys aren't going to remember when you were born. Um, parents, though, you remember that feeling when you're holding an infant child in your hand. It's not like you're going to know the, the upcoming 18 years to an exact, but there was that beautiful, deep promise holding in your hand, something good will come of this child. I, I don't have a kid, but I've heard way too many stories about that first moment and know that it's going to be incredible when it comes. Now you're 18. There's, no, there's still a lot of promise to behold. That hasn't gone away. But you're about to go on to an amazing journey. And your parents still hold that same promise for you. There's just been 18 years difference between that infancy year. There's been a journey. A lot of things have come and gone. For Abraham's descendants, there was also a journey between the moment that God says, to this land I will give you your, your this will be your land, and that promise being actualized. Um, so, for those of us who know, on the Old Testament, let me give give a little quick recap. Between that promise of, hey, this will be your land, your descendants land, and that actually being an, a reality, hundreds of years would ensue. So, long time. Abraham's descendants would grow, and they would be enslaved in Egypt. And then they would leave Egypt to the great exodus. Then they would travel the desert for a long time. Then they would spend a long time trying to conquer the land that was promised to them, which they would achieve. But from Abraham, one man, we would then get thousands. It's not, not like we've been just hanging out. There's been some time spent. And now we get to Joshua 24, where all that they worked for is finally there. So another thing that particularly you seniors might be experiencing is I think there's this weird thing in life where you have particular big book in moments. Childhood, for example. Um, maybe going into retirement is another. There's this thing that we do where we, I think it's such a big moment that we focus so heavily on it. The next phase can kind of get scary once we get there. For example, you're, you're so excited to graduate high school. I just, you know, I just want to be done with this high school crazy I'm over this. Senioritis was awesome for me, I guess. Um, but once you hit it, once, you're, once you've graduated, it's like, well, what's next? 
what's next? Obviously college or a job, but what does that look like tangibly? You know, for those of you who are have waited to retire and then hit retirement, what's next? You know, it's like obviously retirement, but what does that look like in flesh? That's a, it can get kind of scary. So here's what we get. Joshua 24, verse 1. Then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. Same spot. He summoned the elders, the leaders, the judges, the officials of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. So that's Joshua chapter 24, verse 1. And what we get is Joshua, who's been their leader for the, this whole conquest time, is not going to be their leader much longer. This is really Joshua's like final call. So at the very end, the whole chapter is Joshua's final words. And um, spoiler alert, Joshua dies at the end. So at the end of the chapter, sorry, Bill. Um, so his final call to his people. Remember, to their patriarch, God said, to your offspring, I will give this land. Some of you can feel the weight, but at Shechem, God called to Abraham. At Shechem, God's promise is accomplished. It's the same place, different time. But in this time, the descendants get to breathe in the fresh air of that accomplishment for the very first time. That's really what we're getting here. At Shechem, at the same place, you are those people. God's promise is realized in you. I think this text asks a very specific question, mostly to you seniors. And the question is this. What's gotten you here? Sure, you're in the same place. It kind of maybe feels mundane for a lot of you. I think this question can impact us. To you seniors, today, I'll tell you, your parents feel a little extra pride in their chest. They're really proud of you. But why? What makes today so special? For the Israelites, something had gotten them here. They had to ask themselves the same question. Verses 2 through 13 really sums it up. Though we're not going to get into it, so I'm going to kind of sum it up for you. In short, it's God speaking to them as their parent, reminding them of all the good works that he had done for them. He was kind of saying, Israelites, you're here let me remind you what got you here. I took you out of Egypt. I helped you conquer this land. This is my promise. It has happened. All these physical acts. So as you try to think about what got you here, so often I find that as a personal life truth that I witness God's love to me through physical acts. Through the, through the moments of someone's love I find that to be God's love. Nothing more pure than someone's love. Oftentimes, we really, I think, witness that love through our church, through people that are really close to us, and most often through our parents, through our guardians. They are God to us. So to help you brainstorm, I'm not giving you the the cop-out. I want you to do this this afternoon. Figure out really what got you here Think of the tangible ways, but here's a little way of brainstorming to help you get started. I find this to swell your heart, so I think this is a good practice. I encourage anyone to do it. For example, think about how crazy it would be if you knew how many prayers were said over you. If you could just count them all, how many would you think there would be? Think about how many hours your parents have literally held you probably when you're an infant, not recently, but it's a, it's a high number. How many times has a Band-Aid been placed on your knee or somewhere? Or how many times have they waited for you in the hospital? How many hours have been spent working a job to provide a house for you, to provide an income, provide food for you? How many hours are spent up and down the grocery aisle by your parents? How many, to- how many hours have been spent cooking a meal just so you could eat? How many times do you think the words, I love you, have been said to you, whether you heard them or not? Scholars reflect, and I love this, verses 2 through 13 is God's summary of the Israelite lifetime, as well as anyone could in uh, roughly 11 verses summarize that whole bit of information. 
If you notice in verse 7, God kind of skips over their biggest downfall. I quote God saying, then you lived in the wilderness for a long time, period. And anyone who knows the Israelite story knows that they weren't just chilling in the wilderness. It wasn't just a relaxed time to hang out and have some good time. So it seems kind of odd that all God has to say about their wilderness experience was, you were just there for a bit, and now you're not. What scholars really reflect of God brushing over kind of their worst moment, their least shining moment, is really a true aspect to love itself. Then, in comparison to God's love, even our biggest acts of a faulty moment, perhaps in your own mind, is nothing in comparison to the love of God. It gets down, downcast, downshadowed, or whatever word I'm looking for. You could, so you could write in grace is an aspect of what's gotten you here, here today. There are countless hours that God has loved you through your parents and through this church and so many others. And I think this is another big call to you. You're about to move on. Childhood is done. There is a really big moment for any of us who have to realize or to come to grips with so much, the fact that so much of who we are today is directly due to what we've been given. Not, you know, you want to be so proud for yourself. I am I love to do this. I'm, I'm amazing. I'm preaching this amazing sermon. Like, oh, it's all me. That's, that's a very prideful reality that isn't true. So much of who you are is directly due to those who poured into you. Those who have loved you, cared for you, have made you who you are. It's turning those gifts or those privileges into who you will become. So, now we're going to look at verse 14 and 15. And here I want you to recognize, or take the weight for what it is. Again, Joshua is their leader, but he's about to kind of, it's like a parent letting go of their kid before graduation. Joshua's last words. So he says, verse 14, Now, or therefore, fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods of your ancestors, worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. But... If serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are now living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. I think this one's a kind of weird weird passage, so we're going to unpack it a little bit. Two points specifically I want to make today out of this passage. The first has to do with the faith for where we've been. And the second has to do with the faith for where we've never been. So the faith for where we've been, or particularly for the faith for where you've been, is kind of what I was just talking about. Faith for what someone else has poured into you. Um, particularly in this passage, if you notice, Joshua sums up with his first two sentences, serve the Lord. You can kind of summarize this whole passage as a big call to, I'm letting go of you as your leader. Please just serve the Lord in some method. Isn't that a cry of just, I can't, I can't control you anymore, but if you could do one thing, please do this one thing. But to be specific, he says, throw away the gods of your ancestors that served beyond the Euphrates River. There have been mistakes that they have made in the past, the Israelites, that is, since their origin. Even Abraham didn't originally serve Yahweh. And a lot of you seniors... You guys may have made some mistakes here or there. It has been 18 years since you were freshly born on this earth. You've already begun to learn or articulate to you what faith is. That's a very powerful thing for anyone else to do. Joshua here calls to his people as he calls to you. What you have learned is good or what you've learned contributes to you being good, contributes to you serving the Lord. Please continue doing so. Hold on to that. Know what that is and don't let go. Then he says, as it gets to me, the the otter part, he says, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates, again, what mistakes you've made in the past, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're now, now living. So this part of Joshua's calling is for the future. So if I can book in this whole faith where we've never been. 
here I think really comes where it hits home. So again, a quick reminder for those of you whose uh, Bible Bowl days are a little rusty. We don't really do that anymore. Um, so ju- the Israelites are about to split up, just like you seniors are about to go into multiple different paths. That's, that's the reality of it. And the Israelites were about to do their own thing for the next 400 years. 400 years. So as a reminder, the United States of America is awesome, uh, perhaps, to some of us. So it's about to turn 242. We're, we're pretty young. The Israelites are about to spend 400 years as their own individual tribes doing their own thing. It was going to be a great period for them, full of a lot of learning experiences. And um, I guess we could leave it at that. Joshua is calling to them because he knows where they're about to go, into a new land. He says, the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live, locationally, we will always, as a human species, struggle to adopt the new behaviors and habits of those we're around. That is, I think, what's available to us. When we move, it's a good thing, but there is always the availability of doing what is good and what is not. We don't always know the, the yes or no to what those are. I, what I really want to call out is when anything happens to you all, have grace with yourself. Have grace. You're going to learn the strong way what is good and what isn't, what is right and what is not. I think an important thing to point out in this passage is it wasn't a passage for them served to, uh, as a one-time thing. It wasn't like we're witnessing them at one moment say, Yes, I will do these things, Joshua. And then, uh, and then they were supposed to be 100% from there on out. It's not like uh, when they maybe made a mistake in the future, they said, well, shoot, we had promised we wouldn't, and now we have, so we're, we're done for. This is, this is the beauty of the church, isn't it? This is where salvation comes in. This passage would have served them as a daily reminder. The hard reality, I feel like, for us growing up is to realize Every single day, we have to choose for ourselves which gods we will serve. Either the God that loves us or those in the land we are living. And it's not easy. Mostly because the life changes. The world changes so often. And so things will happen here and there. Joshua calls us to have grace with ourselves. But here's the most, I guess the last thing I'll leave you with. Joshua ends by saying, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Again, not a passage for a one-time moment, particularly because Joshua, right after this passage, uh, dies. So it's not very special for him to say, I'm going to serve the Lord forever, and then he dies. It's like, okay, that wasn't too tough for you there, buddy. No, it was more of a call coming to them out of the grave, as in, Um, as they were to remind themselves, our leader was for the Lord, as ought we be. Uh, I hope that makes sense. Really, where I think this hits home for you all, well, we don't know the future. There's a great chance, I believe, that Twickenham will still be here in 50 years. I think that should be a prayer, you know, but there's a great chance. It's not going to be the same people. We will change a lot, but a large portion of what this church is, is here. God willing, your parents, particularly, will still be here 25 years from now. <laughs> the point is, in the future, you have people that know you. You always have people that know you. And I think the last thing I want to leave us here is that we know you. No matter, 50 years from now, no matter how much this church has changed, Twickenham knows you. And it's such a beautiful gift, I think, to have this church particularly, from what I've gotten to learn from it, to be your growing up church, if you can quote that. You know, everyone's got one. The church I grew up in is, for you, it's, I grew up at Twickenham. And I don't think that's going to serve you poorly. But in the future, no matter where you go on your journey, know that you've got this church. I would encourage you to take with you uh, one of those directional, uh, directionals, directories. There are phone numbers in there all over the place. You could call one of those phone numbers and they would, any of us would pick up and, and love to have a conversation with you. Even if it's that you're feeling lonely, 
let us be reminded that you are not alone on this earth. Particularly, too, when you feel oh, the world can be kind of scary, let's be honest. And when life hurts, we are here. Twickenham is here. We will always be here for you. We love you. Very sad to see you go. So, faith where we've never been. It gets scary. But we have the faith where we've, we've come from. We have our family. We have our parents. I hope that encourages us all, but I hope that mostly encourages you all. We love you. Let's pray. Heavenly God, we are grateful, O oh Lord, to be human. We're grateful, O oh Lord, to know how much you are here for us, to feel your love through so many physical acts. God, we call to you and ask for your encouragement and your courage. Courage to do what's right in this world and to be bold. I pray that this day your name is served well, that you are praised beyond all measure, and that your grace may abound. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we stand. These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant, Moses, righteousness being restored. And though these are days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sword, still we are the voice in the desert, crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun, and the trumpet calls, so lift your voice, it's the year of Jubilee, and now the Zion's new salvation comes. These are the days of Ezekiel, the dry bones becoming as flesh. And these are the days of your servant, David, rebuilding a temple of praise. And these are the days of the harvest, the fields are wide in the world. And we are the laborers in your vineyard, declaring the word of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, so lift your voice. It's the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. Who was, and who is, and who is to come? Who was? All right, so here, as we end our service, we're going to end, um, as we do every year, I think the most special time we get is to honor and pray over our seniors. So at this time, I'd like to ask uh, all available elders and elders' wives, you guys would make your way behind me, um, and then I'm going to call up by name each senior, um, and if you would, when you come up, come up and find an elder, they have a gift for you. Um, we want to send you away with two books we hope that serve you well in your faith as you move on from our church. Um, but if you would, when your name's called, come on up. We're going to start, um, what's the opposite of first but not least? So we're going to begin with a good one. I don't know, I'm just being silly, sorry. All right, so Jackson Bridges, if you would, come on up. Jackson is graduating from Bridges Academy. 
He is the son of Robin and Shannon Bridges. Ethan Chastain. Graduating from Grissom High School, son of Mark and Larissa Chastain. Maggie Gardner. Daughter, graduating from uh, Randolph Academy, daughter of Steve and Stacy Gardner. Jacob Horton. <laughs> graduating from Covenant Christian Academy, son of Kevin and Vicki Horton. Shay McGriff. Uh, Shay graduates from Buckhorn High School, daughter of Don and Adrian McGriff. Jesus Mora. Uh, Jesus is graduating from Grissom High School, son of Maria Lavonette. Abby Mullins. Abby's graduating from Grissom High School, daughter of Jessica Patterson. And then Chance Potts. <laughs> Dashing young man, graduating from Grissom High School, son of Lee and Julie Potts. Ian. <laughs> yeah, leave, the, leave the gifts. Ian Shell. <laughs> Ian graduates from Grissom High School, son of Mike and Michelle Shell. Riley Schrode. <laughs> Riley graduates from Bob Jones High School, son of Tim and Lori Schrode. Twickenham Church. I want you guys to, I don't know, stand with me if you don't mind. I want to acknowledge and honor these seniors. All right, if you would remain standing with me um, for just a moment. Similar to what we just went through in Joshua 24, I have a call and response for us. We are Twickenham Church, those of us in this room. Even if you're visiting with us, we view the same. You are a part of this declaration. Um, I want you to respond to me with the words, we will, if you so um, agree with my request. So, to begin Twickenham Church, I ask you, will you, members of Twickenham Church body, promise to love and cherish these seniors, whether they are with us or away from us? And will you promise to send them away, blessed by you in prayer? Amen. Now to you seniors, you just have to say it once. <laughs> just like the words of Joshua, we ask you to choose today whether you serve, uh, to choose today which God you will serve, whether Yahweh's son, uh, his son Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit. We will. I didn't end that super well, so that's okay. I don't know that. <laughs> um, you have with you this whole church looking to you with their love, their admiration. You have these elders behind you with their love and admiration. You are loved. I hope you feel that and know that. To end, I'm going to have um, Lee and Chance Lee's going to have a benediction. It kind of goes for us all, but particularly for you all seniors. And a chance to close us out in prayer. May Christ be with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Bow with me. God, there isn't much that I can say that hasn't been said already, but there is one thing that can't be said enough, and that's thank you. Thank you for everything that you have given us, your son that you sent down to die on the cross for us, 
everything that you will give us in the future, the promises that you have made to us. Thank you. Amen.